Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to November 1983 to check out all the Sinclair news and latest Spectrum game releases, we blast off to find the ultimate Galaxian clone, we take a look at some early a &F games, and look at some newer titles. But first, it's back into the time machine in November 1983. With rumours of a new machine from Sinclair, Nigel Searle, the managing director, tried to calm down worried Spectrum owners and at the same time announce a new initiative to help developers. The new machine, he said, currently named as ZX83, will not be a replacement for the Spectrum and we are still committed to that machine. He went on, there are no plans for a new low-cost machine but there will be a new low-cost development system for the ZX83. It will be supplied by Sinclair to allow developers to easily create software for the new business computer that is due to be launched in early 1984. In light of the worries about software piracy, a Dublin-based company has launched a series of utilities that allow software houses to protect their programs. Microcraft's products consist of three packages. Basic Protectrum, which stops merging and listening to screen our printer and would corrupt the code if triggered. Machine Code Protectrum does the same for machine code and Anti-Copier Protectrum secures software from tape copying programs that are available. Macmillan, the book publishers, have joined up with Sinclair to produce a series of educational software for the Spectrum. The five titles, all called Learn to Read, help children with spelling and letter recognition. More titles have been announced including a series of Science Horizon programs called Survival, Glider and Cargo. A new low-cost joystick has been released that does not require an interface. The Spectrum Stick, as it is called, clips onto the keyboard of the Spectrum and four small feet press the direction keys when the stick is moved. The Spectrum Stick is produced by Grant Design and costs £9.95. Although there are several speech units available for the Spectrum, none has really got support from software companies until now. Many of the major players, including Ultimate, Digital Fantasies, Arctic, Bugbyte and Quicksilver, have all said they will be supporting the device produced by Cura. The Cura Microspeech unit is priced at £29.96. Sinclair have announced their intention to challenge Acon for the new BBC computer contract, which comes up for renewal next summer. They have openly admitted that it interests them, and are in contact with the BBC to see what options are available. Acon seem unruffled by the news, originally winning the contract ahead of Sinclair in April 1981. And that was the news from November 1983. And now onto the top selling games. The charts are a frenzy of activity at the moment as the festive season draws closer, with all major companies releasing titles. Ultimate released Lunar Jetman, follow up to Jetpack. Ocean released Kong, the classic arcade conversion. Melbourne House released Pterodactyl, a new spin on Space Invaders. Quicksilver gave us Ant Attack and Bugaboo the Flea, both excellent titles. DKtronics released Maziax, a conversion of their ZX81 game Mazogs. Imagine released Zip Zap. And Jarell released Harrier Attack. And that was the news and releases from November 1983. Galaxian was created and developed by Namco and distributed by Midway in 1979. The creator's main aim was to improve on the standard Space Invaders game, adding a multitude of new features including mini music intro, multicoloured animated sprites, swooping aliens, scrolling starfield and icons to depict progress and lives. The game was an instant success and still remains popular today and it is one of my all time favourite arcade games. I thought that this episode shootout would be a mammoth task due to the huge amounts of clones there are, but I was surprised by just how few there were. There were a lot of similar shoot-em-ups to Galaxian on the Spectrum, and it can sometimes prove difficult to separate genres. With this in mind, I tried to be quite strict about the games I tested. So, which game can claim the Galaxian crown? First up we have Birds, by Interphase Publications, released in 1983. This is a very slow basic game to be honest, and I didn't want to include it, but it's here now, and the best we can do is skip over it quickly. The graphics are badly drawn, the control is poor, the sound is well below average, everything stops when you fire, or an alien swoops. A really terrible game. Next up we have Classic Axioms from Bubblebus, released in 1988. 
This game at least looks like the arcade, although there is no scrolling starfield. The aliens are large, too large I think, given the aspect ratio of the screen, as this gives the player less room to manoeuvre. They are nicely animated and move smoothly, swooping down just like the arcade version. The sound is adequate, but the downside is the pace of the game, making it very difficult to get past the first sheet. Because of the size of the aliens and the tiny amount of room you have, and the actual game speed, this makes the game more difficult than it should be. Not a bad effort overall, but the difficulty curve is far too high. Next we have Convoy by Spectrum Computing from 1984. This was released on a cover tape and is a typical example of what you would get on the cover tapes around that time. The graphics are character based making the movement jerky and aiming a nightmare. The game does follow the arcade format but again lacks a scrolling starfield. The control because it is based on 8 pixel jumps is dodgy and the sound soon begins to get on your nerves. For a cover tape in 1984 not bad. For an arcade clone, pretty poor. Next we have Galactians from DKtronics, released in 1983. You are initially hit with loads of options before the game actually begins. You can set the speed, the playing level, types of missiles, and lots of other things. Setting things to the easiest options, the game kicks off and we have a good representation of the arcade layout. Still no Starfield though. The aliens are about right, but the player ship is far too large. Despite this though, the game plays well with some nice controls and sound effects. I particularly like the explosions. So far this is the only game that has rotating aliens after they have swooped and rejoined the group. Very nice. On the slowest speed though, it's a tad easy and the graphics seem to crawl along. I tried a higher level to see what would happen, but the aliens still flew at the same speed, but just more often. Overall this is a good game but a touch more speed and a smaller player ship would have helped. Certainly one of the top contenders at the moment. This is Galactic Raiders from Titan Programs, released in 1983. The initial choice of skill levels was fun, the first time, but then it just starts to get annoying. Let's cover the good points first. The player ship looks like the arcade game. And now onto the bad points. The aliens don't look or act like the arcade game, they flicker across the screen, they're not animated, and when they dive they just gravitate towards your ship, making the game pretty difficult. The sound is below average, and no scrolling starfield. Will we ever get one of those, I ask? As you can see, this is a poor game, so stay clear. Next up is Galaxians from Microgen, released in 1983. Initial game setup allows for keyboard or joystick, and an option to select the game speed. Once into the game we get a typical early Microgen game. The aliens are not animated, even when they swoop, and the player ship is a little on the large side. But look folks, we have at last a scrolling starfield, and even a nice little tune at the start of the game. The gameplay is fine, as is the controls, and overall this isn't a bad version. This could have been improved with a few simple things. A smaller player ship, animated aliens, and a score panel that didn't have a yellow background. Apart from that though, a decent effort from Microgen. This is the official conversion by Atarisoft from 1984. As you would expect, this is very close to the arcade game, and even has not only a scrolling starfield, but a multicoloured one at that. The track mode is present, setting out the scoring system, and from then on you have a nearly perfect arcade conversion. The only thing I can see missing is the firing sound. The aliens are all present, correctly drawn and animated, the player ship is right at last, and the game mechanics are spot on. If I had to moan about something, and I suppose I always will do, it would be the display of the scores. Slightly too big for my liking, but apart from that, a cracking game and as close as you're gonna get to the real thing on a spectrum. Is there any need to go on? Well, we might as well. This is Galaxians from Arctic Computing in 1982. This was a version I grew up with and I thought was the best one. We have a level select before the game starts and once we get into the action we have quite a close version. 
nicely drawn and animated aliens that move and swoop correctly, but the player ship could be a bit smaller, but the aspect ratio of the playing area is changed by the side panels so there's more vertical room. The sound is good, only missing when you fire. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? There's no scrolling Starfield. But despite this, the game control is smooth and responsive, and the difficulty is just about right, making this a nice playing experience. Overall a good effort by Arctic, and well worth tracking down. Next we have Galaxy Warlords from r, r Software, released in 1983. This is a curious game, mainly because I could not get the controls to work despite several attempts with different settings across multiple emulators. This means that it was difficult to review, as I can only watch the attract mode. Strangely the game responds to key presses to start the game, but then ignores anything else afterwards. Anyway, from what I can see the aliens are too large, and in fact everything is too large. But still, things look nice and the graphics are smooth. Sound is okay, and the gameplay looks quite good, but again, because I couldn't play it, I'm just guessing. Next we have Kamikaze from a &F in 1983. I wasn't sure whether to include this or not, but it does have similarities to the arcade game. This is an early release from a &F, and differs from other Galaxian clones in that it has multicoloured aliens. This makes the game look quite nice, if it wasn't for the jerky movement. The game moves the player from space back to, presumably, World War II, although the depictions of biplanes seem to point to an earlier time. Movement, as already mentioned, is jerky, but the number of aliens does allow for some half-decent gameplay. Sound is below par, with just a few effects for swooping aliens, firing and explosions. The aliens, or in this case planes, do change from level to level, and there is a bonus round that sees you with 20 shots against 20 enemy craft. Overall not a bad version, but certainly not close in format. Next we have Space Defender, from Spectrum Computing in 1983. Again this is a cover tape game. This is a slow, basic version with jerky graphics and poor sound. The aliens are not animated, and the only things to swoop, if you can call it that, are the large yellow ones at the top. These, every now and again, just drop straight down like a brick, and everything else stops when they do this. One to forget, really. And finally, this is the last one, and it's a bit of fun. This is Vegetable Crash from Kuma Computers in 1984. Yes, it's not a space-looking game, or at least have aliens, but it does follow the Galaxian format. And it's not a bad game, either. Rows of vegetables line up, nicely drawn and animated, occasionally swooping down, and you have to dodge or shoot them. All standard stuff really, but nicely done. Everything is smooth, with nice controls and good sound effects, and yes it even has a multicoloured scrolling star field. If you like Galaxian, give this a try and ignore the fact that it's vegetables that you're shooting, you might even like it. And so, the winner is... It just had to be the official release from Atarisoft. This is as close as you're going to get to Galaxian on the Spectrum, and if you're a fan of the game, then this is the only one to get. Enjoy. This is Painter, released in 1983 by ANF Software. This is pre Chucky Egg, and ANF were producing a mixture of games varying in quality from average to poor. This one, though, sits outside of average and gets into the good category, although it seems to have been missed by a few people. Loosely based on the arcade game Amidar, the game sees you controlling Patrick the Painter in his bid to paint a large room filled with large paint pots. You have a limited amount of paint and a crazy roller chasing you around. Paint can be replenished by surrounding a pot and the level is complete when all the room is painted. The chasing roller seems to have low intelligence, but this makes it more difficult in a way, because you can't predict any patterns. The controls are simple enough, up, down, left and right, and the graphics are large, well drawn and smooth. Sound is used well, and the gameplay is quite addictive. As each level is complete, another roller is added, making things more difficult. At times it can become quite frantic, but never frustrating. This was one of my first purchases, and soon became one of those games that I loaded up now and again just to have a quick round of gaming. It's simple, well written, and fun to play. 
What more do you need? This is Jungle Fever, and never a more frustrating game have I played in my life. The game obviously takes its ideas from Pitfall on the Atari 2600, but completely removes the gameplay. The graphics are nice and smooth, if a little flickery, and if you ever get past the second screen, you'll find much the same throughout the game. Screen 1 is straightforward enough, giving you some hope of a half decent game. Here you just have to jump over the three waterfalls and exit screen right. screen is a killer. Getting onto the rope is easy enough, most of the time, but getting off is a completely different matter. It involves stabbing the keys when you think the rope is as far right as it's going to get, but usually you'll find yourself plummeting into the pit again and again. This soon gets boring. Once you are finally across, after about three or four days work, the next screen sees you jumping over two randomly moving things. No idea what they are really. But because they have no fixed patterns, it's impossible to plan your jumps, and again it's just down to guesswork and good luck. Once you're over this, it's back to the waterfalls again, this time with what looks like a tree poking up randomly. On the next screen, an arrow is added, making jumping just that little bit more tricky. All this game needed to make it more playable was an easier learning curve and enemies that weren't random and had fixed patterns, then at least you could make some progress. As it is, Jungle Fever is just a mass of frustrating guesses that turns out bad most of the time. I suggest you keep away from this one if you value your sanity. Space Disposal was released in 2011 by me, and is a crossover of several game types. The idea is that space junk has been deposited on various planets, and you work for a company that has been paid to clean it up. Each planet consists of several screens littered with debris that you have to collect. Crazy droids and meteor showers cause deadly obstacles, but at least you have your trusty lasers. The droids, when shot, do not disappear from the screen, they just get regenerated at fixed locations. You can use this to your advantage, clearing them out of the way to collect a piece of debris and keeping an eye on when they regenerate. Each piece of junk holds salvageable energy and once all pieces have been collected you have enough energy to jump to the next planet. The graphics are similar in style to Cybernoid, as is the gameplay and control, so players of that game should feel right at home. The sound is good and the game never gets too frustrating, I hope. As with all of my arcade games, this was written with the Arcade Games Designer, details of which can be found in Episode 6. If you like this type of game, shooting, collecting, progressing, why not give it a try? It's free. Hope you like it. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.